OK, so um, I'm not going to be able to tell you how to implement functional optics, um, which is another topic. But I've had got, I did a uh, two-hour presentation to my work on how to do that. Um, I don't have two hours here. So sadly, I just have to show you some examples of how I've used uh, optics in production. Um, but how do, we get to, how do we get to functional optics? Um, well, functional programming is the only ethical thing to do. Actually, I, um, I gave uh, a similar presentation to this uh, to my coworkers. And uh, for a little while afterwards, they stopped saying functional programming. They started calling it ethical programming. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. Um, so we're doing functional programming because it's the right thing to do, right? Um, does, it, does anybody agree that working with immutable data can sometimes be annoying? Some people do, yeah. Um, so your manager comes up to you and says, I've got you know, that list, that, that page that lists all those people out. I want their street uh, names to be in uppercase. And so if we were to do JavaScript, um, this is easy, right? Um, you will notice that there's a little bit of code duplication between you know, the person, street, name. That's, that's annoying. But this is easy to write. We can just write this out. Now, if we were to do this, if you were a beginner to Haskell and you were to write this, it would look something like this. Um, you go through each person, you map through each person, um, extract out the fields from the person, then run a function over one of the fields, and then extract out some more data, and then re and rebuild it all back up. So it's a lot of copying, and it's a pretty annoying to do, right? And so um, does anybody, um, does, does everybody agree that uh, this code is more annoying than this code? Yeah. Does anybody prefer this code at all? Yes. You're a good person. <laughs> that, that is the ethical response. <laughs> um, we should still be doing functional programming, even if it's annoying, is my point. Um, but we should be trying to be less annoying than JavaScript. I think that's a pretty low bar, and I think we should be able to, <laughs> we should be able to go, go past that. We should be less annoying than JavaScript. And so using functional optics, we can achieve this. So this, we can actually see, is shorter and, and it's a lot better in, in many ways. So not only have we done a little bit better than, than JavaScript, we've actually completely smashed JavaScript out of the water. It's gone. Um, if you see here, there's a, we've got a couple of things going on. Um, street, name, and address are all lenses. Traverse is something called a traversal. And these are type of optics. And each of these compose together. So you can take an address and a street, and you compose it together, and you get a lens. If you compose together the traverse and the address first, you get a traversal. And so these all compose together, and you get different types based on what you, could, what you compose together. And so this all compiled up together gets a traversal. And there's kind of a hierarchy that, that comes out of that. Um, I'll, I'll show examples of each one. Um, but if you take an ISO, which is like the, the, the strongest claim you can make about, about two types, um, if you weaken parts of it, you get two different types of optics. And you can weaken more parts of it and get to different types of optics. Um, so there's a, there's a hierarchy that's going on. Uh, these, are, these are libraries that I've used in, uh, in production. Um, I've written uh, optics. I've uh, used optics in each of these, in each of these uh, libraries. <coughs> I, I like to call this the state of the art. Um, there are some drawbacks to this encoding of optics. But um, going, from, um, from going from George's uh, uh, talk, um, you can see that we've got a profunctor. And this is just an ISO at the top. That's just an ISO. Um, and by changing the profunctor constraint, by changing it to either a strong or a choice, but just special types of, of profunctors, we get to different types of, of lenses. Um, so specialization of the type creates special lenses. And so we can create lenses just by changing the constraint on, on this type. So there's a, there's a library called Halogen. And it, uh, it's a UI library for um, doing uh, JavaScript uh, front ends. Um, and one way that we can uh, use Halogen is by uh, chucking in um, uh, uh, lenses when we, have this, uh, when we have the state update function. So Halogen's kind of split into two different parts. There's the state update function where you take an event and you take some state and you get some new state. So when someone clicks on something, you can update some state. Uh, and there's the other side, which is rendering that state to some HTML and showing some HTML on the screen. Um, 
in, I work for a company called Slam Data, and we use lenses to update the state pretty much always. So whenever you click on something, a lens would go in, change some field. So we'd have like a, we'd have a big uh, settings object or a big uh, application state object, and inside of that object there'd be uh, there'd be some states so like uh, there'd be settings. And inside of that, there'd be uh, maybe a notebook. And inside of a notebook, there'd be cells. And so if you click on a button, we have to go traverse all the way through and update a single cell. In this example, we're actually, we've actually got a dialog. And we're just making sure that there is a dialog shown on the screen, making sure that's the rename dialog, and then getting out the directories. And so we can, we can use this, this traversal and either access out, the, uh, access out all the resources from, from what's being shown on the screen or we can manipulate it in some way, we can insert a resource in there somewhere. Um, so just by composing together these things, we get a way to go through a big nested data structure. Does that make some sense? So Lens is a library. Um, it's a library uh, written in, in Haskell. It's uh, the original motivation for a lot of this. Um, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's not as nice as, as, the, as the example I just showed before. If you look at the encoding, this, uh, uh, you don't have to just know about profunctors. You also have to know about why that functor is in there. Um, you also have to know why this applicative is in there. And so it's not quite as nice. Um, so if you're looking to learn about how, how lenses actually work, this is a lot nicer formulation to work with. But a lot of you will probably be using lens um, in production if you're, if you're starting off. Um, with Lens. So I, I, I do a Haskell workshop at work, and um, we're trying to write an application that, that uh, goes through Kinesis and gets out all, all these, uh, these records from Kinesis and manipulates them in some, manipulates them in some way. And so um, in the workshop, we were uh, just trying to, trying to get out um, what, what we, what we've, some events that we've put into, into Kinesis. And so, I was able to just um, start with the first two lines and print out the response. Then I was able to get out the um, items from the response, go through each one of those, get out the event record. And so each of these I was just incrementally putting in a new uh, lens um, or a new optic to get out a particular field. And so I was able to interactively show people um, who are new to Haskell how you can incrementally go through and get out individual parts and say, well, now, like, show it to the screen and, and say, you know, we've got this big, big record. Now, how about we got this little field out? And so, you know, you'd be able to chuck in just a single optic and show how uh, we've got a new field out. And so at each, each of these, I was able to print out a single part of, of, uh, of this big data structure that we got back, which is a huge list, like, of, of like 40 different records and able to just show Here's how we can get out a single event from it, how we can get out the name, how we can convert this into a data structure that we want to actually manipulate. And so it's an interactive way of, of working with, with things. And it was very nice to, to show um, people new to Haskell how you, can, uh, how you don't have to just use um, something like Python to be able to interactively work with data. You can actually just have a standard language for, for getting out parts of a data structure. Um, so Monocle is a uh, is a library that um, uh, th for for optics in in Scala. Uh, it, it tries to it it, tr it changes the hierarchy a little bit, so the hierarchy isn't uh, isn't actually this. It's a little bit different, um, but it's very close to that. It's it's different for Scala optimization reasons, not for any other actual theoretical reasons. And this is a lot more code, so. Instead of writing this, we're now writing this. And that's just how you, we have to do it in Scala, sadly. Um, this might be a little bit more uh, straightforward to some people. Um, you have a function to go one way, you've got a function to go the other way. That's how, how an ISO works. And if you weaken them and you strengthen parts of them, you get to different, um, you get to different optics. So this is completely avoiding the uh, profunctors that George mentioned, later, uh, mentioned earlier, um, and just encoding them in a straightforward way in Scala, which sadly has um, some, some downsides, uh, but it's about as good as we can get in, in, in Scala. Um, so there's something called plated that um, is in Monocle, and it's a way of talking about a recursive data structure. 
So JSON is a good example of a recursive data structure. And um, we can write a plated instance, which basically just runs a function over every recursive part of a JSON data structure. So for every, every recursive element, we run a function over it. Does that make some sense? And by writing this one function, by uh, writing this one implementation of plated for JSON, um, we can write something like this, which is um, we had a uh, at work we had a we had a library that we were using, and it was generating a big data structure. We're using Scala Check, which is like Quick Check, but for Scala, and it was generating a, a, a big data structure for our test, and the Amazon libraries were crashing on certain inputs um, of this data structure. Um, we were converting it to JSON or something, sending it across, and it, and it would crash. So um, uh, turns out there was these problems with these specific Unicode characters. Um, so basically what, what, what we had to do is filter out those from this big data structure that we were generating. Um, now we could try and fix the generator, but I didn't really have easy access to do that. So alternatively, what I did is I um, uh, transformed this big data structure into JSON, recursively replaced all of the, uh, all the strings with strings without those Unicode characters, and then converted it back. So just go through the whole data structure, find all the strings, and remove all of those dodgy Unicode characters that Amazon's crashing on. And then convert it back, send it across. Um, my coworker did better than me and actually went back to the original library and stopped at generating those things, which is a better solution, but this shows how easy it is to go through a recursive data structure and just manipulate it and change uh, particular parts of a recursive data structure. Um, in Scala as well, we, uh, uh, I worked on an application that uh, we had, um, we had a lot of components in this application. It's quite a big application. And um, there's probably like 15 different components to this application and we wanted to keep error. Um, we didn't want just one big error type. We wanted to have errors for this component, errors for this component, errors for this component, and then just join them all together, basically. Um, and so class C optics is a, is a method for, the, for taking on that. <clears throat> um, so we can represent, um, we can represent the, uh, the, the type of errors as a, as a type class. So this trait up the top is actually uh, representing, uh, it's actually trying to encode a type class. And so in that, we've got two, two things called prisms. Prisms are ways of uh, creating data from data. So um, uh, here, what we're actually saying is that we can create, from a unit, we can create a not found error. Um, and so we can actually instantiate this to a specific, um, specific case, a specific, specific type. So in uh, one of our libraries, we actually had this thing, which is a user failure. And we can say that we can instantiate a not found user error to this particular type using this implementation. And so the, the instantiation is just this, just create an instance of that type. And so how we were able to um, use this was uh, uh, <coughs> by putting a constraint on the type E, so the error type, we're able to put a constraint on there and say that I, as long as you can instantiate this to some sort of user failure, then you can use this function. Does it make some sense? That we can throw errors, but not be specific about what type of errors we're throwing? That not only, like, so I can instantiate this E to anything that has a user failure inside of it. So I don't have to say what the E is. It can be anything as long as some way you can uh, lift this user failure into it. So this is, this is called classy optics. Um, and this is the way to lift it into a bigger, um, a bigger error. So inside of here, we've got like lots of different components. This is kind of the way that we join all the components together. And so inside of here, you've actually got a, uh, you've got a user failure, which I wrote out before. So this is the specific type that we're instantiating it to. But in this case, we're actually going to put that inside of another data structure. So it's a big nested data structure, right? And so we can actually instantiate it to one particular um, case of that big data structure. So we've got a big application 
error at the end, not inside of this module. This module doesn't know about this big application error. It doesn't know about the query password failure. It has no idea about query password failure, this one component that, that contains this code. And so in the, in the code that actually glues all the components together, uh, it lifts the specific user errors into the particular case that has user errors. Does it make some sense that it's that we're polymorphically lifting errors into a particular um, error type? So we can we don't have to talk about what error type we're using, just what uh, the error type contains. Um, yeah, f functional Java is uh, is a library that um, it. It tries to implement lenses, but it has some downsides. It can't encode everything that um, that monocle can encode, for example. Uh, it's specifically, it's the lack of uh, higher kind of types that prevents encoding certain things. Um, in this hierarchy, in this hierarchy, it's uh, this traversal thing uses higher kind of types, and so functional Java tries to implement it, but uh, it's it, it it it's lacking a lot of of power. And so, what, if you're using functional Java, what you'll probably be ending up with is ISO, lens, prism, and fold. And those are the main ones that you'll be using. Um, so, I, I, I had a problem where um, I had to get some stuff out of DynamoDB using Java. Turns out the DynamoDB library in Java isn't actually good at accessing DynamoDB fields. <laughs> um, so, I built I built some lenses and some uh, um, optics to, to help with that problem. Um, here what we're doing is uh, um, going through, like DynamoDB has a lot of nested. Um, the, the response you get back when you make a query to DynamoDB is, is, is fairly nested. Um, and inside of that nested thing, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of options that you can have, like um, you can have, uh, you can have something that's a string, or you can have something that's a binary, or you can have something that's a map. Um, and theoretically, it can be all of those. Um, the types don't really prohibit any of that. So theoretically, you could set something to be a string and then also set it to be a map. So you kind of have to work around that a bit. But by writing some, uh, by writing some optics, you can just compose it all together and access uh, exactly what you need, need to from, from DynamoDB. Um, so the, so the first thing is that um, I wanted to access out everything using um, uh, everything as, a, uh, as an actual map. The built-in Java map is a little bit dodgy, so you don't want to use that. So um, this is accessing things out as a, uh, as a, as a functional structure. And these are just particular accesses. So, uh, does, uh, this is this is Java 8 syntax, so it's just accessing fields from from objects. Um, yeah, that, so these are just accesses. Uh, prisms are things that uh, have some optionality in them. So uh, we might be able. To, so with a get s, it's getting out a string, but maybe it will fail to get a string because maybe it's a map or maybe it's something else. Um, but maybe there's a string in there. So prisms representing the op optionality. So there's a lot of option from null because Java does dodgy null stuff. So we have to convert it into a functional data structure option. Um, so this is just creating a lot of ways to access things safely because they might fail. Um, this is optional is uh, something that uh, represents um, uh, something that might something that might fail, but also something that you need uh, an instance of to be able to set. Um, so this is, this is saying that if I have, um, if I have a map and I, have, and I, wanna, I have some key into that map, then I might be able to get out something, but also to uh, set that I, might, I, know I need an existing map to be able to set. Um, so all up that, creates this code up the top here, where we are just composing together one big um, um, optic. It's called a fold. Composing all these together creates something called a fold. And so composing these all together, 
we get one big optic that we're able to access a deeply nested DynamoDB data structure in Java. And that's completely immutable, and it, it involves some copying, but because we've just isolated the copying to things like this, um, and things like clone here, so we've isolated the copying so we don't have to do the copying all together and mix it all together like we did in the original example. Uh, we're able to isolate out the copying and compose it all together, and we get one big optic that copies everything, and, tr and we can access or modify whatever we need to in whatever nested data structure we need to. So, yeah, we've, we've outdone non-functional programming. By applying functional programming techniques, we can do better than JavaScript, um, and we get a general tool that we can reuse over and over again. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. Does anyone have any questions? So you showed the, uh, the, the classy optic technique for errors there with, um, with using a, uh, what is it, a prism to put yep. the thing into the proper error type. Uh, I'm interested, uh, I like that technique in Haskell when we, when we can do MTL stuff as well mm. and when we can, um, I, I guess the question I'm asking is to what extent have you had success with that technique in Scala? Is it only for errors, or do you do it for sums with your config as well, or do you...? Only with errors is, is um, how we've done that. Um, we haven't... I don't think we really tried to do it with configuration or anything, but I'm skeptical that it will work because of type inference. Um, basically, once the types get too hard to type out, it's not really worth it, is it? Um, you say the profunctor approach is is clearer. Are you, are you aware of a Haskell version of that approach? If it's not immoral to stray from Edward Komet's work. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 um, Ed Komet actually suggested to Phil Freeman, the creator of PureScript, to, to, to go after this approach. Um, so he's like, because uh, with, with Lens, it also deals with some legacy stuff. That's also part of the reason why this is encoded that way. Um, it's not just because, um, it's not just because this is what he came up with. It's because it's dealing with some legacy stuff, like uh, composition needs to work with, like composition in Haskell usually works on functions, so this actually works with function composition and not categorical composition, whereas in PureScript, we've got actual categories in the, in the standard library. Uh, so this, this actually works straight out of the, like you don't have to import any custom um, uh, composition operator like you would in Haskell. Um, so Ed Komet is actually the one that suggested that Phil Freeman write this and that's how we came up with it. So I, I don't think it's been written in Haskell, but um, it's because of legacy reasons. I think that it's less practical to do this in Haskell. Um, and PureScript not having those legacy problems is able to do it like this. Right, thank you very much. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, Brian. <laughs>